Today we finish the series we have been in called We, we the Church. Next week, uh, Susan's going to kind of wrap up. Uh, it's still going to be titled We the Church. We've been looking at Acts chapter 2. Um, next week, she's going to talk about the DNA of what it is as us as Christ followers. What does that look like for us? We've been talking about what this looks like for the church. She's going to talk about, am I right, or did I just totally change your message on you? Nope. What you're going to be looking at as uh, that. And uh, we're excited. Um, next week, uh, Ricky uh, has been here a few times leading worship, and he's actually going to be leading worship for us next week. And if you haven't been here with Ricky leading, uh, it's amazing. He's a gifted guy that's going to be here. So they're going to be Here next week, Ricky's going to be here. Susan's going to be kind of putting this idea of what it is, the DNA that we have as Christ followers. But today we're going to finish in Acts chapter chapter 2, and we've read this verse every single week. And if you'll throw it up there for me, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed to the apostles. Now all believers were together, and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and their property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And every day the Lord added to the numbers those who were being saved. Um, I have highlighted different words because I feel like there's these, these things that are in this thing that you see this early church doing. There's these, these pieces, this, these parts of their DNA that they were there. And if you've been with us over the last two months, we, we've hit every one of these. They devoted themselves. And, and I, I started this whole series, but, and I, I still believe it. There's something about this area that we understand what it means to devote ourselves to things. We understand this idea of devoting. And if you don't believe me, we have to arrange our entire church schedule around a football team because we know if we would have scheduled tomorrow night, the the pulse check tomorrow night, like at 8.30, ain't no one coming because you're going to be watching the Eagles. That's just the way it is. Not everyone, but there's a lot of that that's that way. It's crazy. We're, 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 I was thinking about um, if, if, if the Phillies uh, made it to the World Series, which I was bummed they didn't, but I was like, well, we should have just watch parties at the church because that's probably the biggest crowds we would get if we would throw the Phillies in the World Series up and, and have watch parties. And I'm not trying to dog on you. I, 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 I'm not. I, this, isn't, this isn't a bash. I'm not trying to bash the Eagles. What I'm saying is, Philadelphia area understands this word devoted. You do. You get it. You know what it means. As an Ohio State fan, if you go to Columbus, it, you understand the word devoted. Next week, we, we, we start what is known in Columbus as we play the team up north, our biggest rivals. They don't even, in, in the newscasts, won't even say the, the university's name. Actually, if you go on the campus of Ohio State University this next week, every single M on the campus will be crossed out. I guarantee it. They under, it is. It's, it's insane. Look it up. It's absolutely crazy because when it comes to that, they, they have this devotion. So when we see this word devoted, I, I don't think I really have to explain it. You guys understand what it means to be devoted. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which if you with us, you understand they, they preach Jesus. It's Jesus that changes stuff. It's Jesus that's the only way. It's Jesus that, that, that is the center of everything we do. He is the hinge piece that holds it all together. It's Jesus. If you take Jesus out of what we're preaching, we're no different than any other world religion that's out there today. Jesus is the difference made. And so they devoted themselves to teaching that. They devoted themselves to fellowship. And I said, it's more than coffee and donuts in the, in the lobby. That stuff's good. That stuff's great. But when we center around um, our core beliefs, what we believe, our core convictions and our behaviors, when we center around those things and we make those things important, it changes then. We, we have this fellowship that's deep because we all value the same things and we're heading in the same direction. They break bread. It's this idea of communion and this idea of, of remembering what was there. They observe communion to remember the past. We remember the present. We give thanks in anticipation for the future. That's what communion does. It's this, this bond that we have of what Jesus has done. And to prayer. Prayer equals change. Prayer equals change. Prayer is so profound in what we do as Christians and as Christ followers. We went on, though, because when it says this word, ah, they were filled with ah. 
I love this because it's just this idea of just being lost in the presence of who Jesus was. They were just in awe of worship of Jesus. And because of that, God was moving and doing things. It says after that that they uh, held all things together. They, there was this idea of unity that they had within them. And then they sold and they did the, their property and distributed this idea of generosity that's there. And then we get to this point today. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. It's crazy. Every single day the church in some facet, in some way was getting together. Every day they devoted themselves. So here's the bottom line. Here's what I want to walk away today with. Gathering is not only essential, but it's biblical. It's not only essential, but it's biblical. In 2020, I feel like this word essential took on a completely different meaning. Because when our world was flipped and, and, and put upside down and, and we were um, going through something that we have never gone through in the entire history of this world, this word essential kind of popped up, essential workers, right? Those that were essential to, to life continuing to go on. And I know there's a lot of debate that's happened all through that, and I'm not here to debate that, but what I'm hearing to say is this, this word essential has kind of taken on a new meaning for us. We get that. We look at it differently. I also think of this word essential as something that is good. If, you're, if someone says to you, like, hey, this is essential to your survival, you start to take, listen, one of the things I've always wanted to do, and my friend keeps saying he'll, he'll set me up and I'm scared, so I just say, well, now I have kids and way more. I've always wanted to jump out of an airplane with a parachute, with a parachute. There's times people have probably wanted to push me out of an airplane, but that's a different story, a different message. Right? You got me? Yeah. Uh, I've always wanted to do that. And I was thinking about that as I was preparing this. I was thinking, like, I can, I can even imagine myself in that, in that plane and the doors open. And if, if my instructor in that moment said, hey, listen, this is essential to what we're about to do. And if you were in that moment, you would listen, right? Because it's essential. If, if things don't go well, things aren't going to go well, right? If something doesn't open up or if something doesn't go right, Things aren't, aren't going to go well for me in that situation. The word essential is important. When we say this word essential, it should help us or should make us stop and take notice. Why is it essential? Essential things matter a lot. They do. Those things that are essential to us matter a lot. But not only that, all over Scripture, it talks about being together. It talks about gathering. It talks about being one in, in this family, in this journey. It talks about the church. It's important. It's important to gather together. One of the hardest things in 2020 was we lost that ability to gather. And some people took it different than other people. And again, I'm not here to debate whether it was right or wrong and all that stuff, the, the reality is, is the reality that we are in. And we couldn't gather. And even me, like, I'm not, I'm not a huge, large crowd person. I'm not, I, I like closer friends. But still in those moments, I, I, I hated it. I hated not being able to gather, to have this distance there's something about that. We need each other. We need that bond. We need to be there for each other. We need to be investing in each other's. And I believe that there's some, something that happens when we choose to gather as a church. I think there's something amazing that happens. I think there's something that, that transcends everything. And when we don't get together, we don't see people taking it serious. It really does break my heart. I was thinking about this. I, I, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm really not. I'm here, I'm here today to, to show you what Scripture has to say and what benefits it is from, from gathering. I'll let the Holy Spirit beat you up by himself. He, he does a great job of that. He doesn't need me. I get it. We're busy. We're busy. There's a lot going on. I look at my schedule some weeks, and we only now only have one kid left in the house. 
and they're still crazy busy. Like there's something that's always happening, always going on, always going to, always being around. There's just a lot that's happening all the time. I get it. We're busy. Most of you work full-time jobs. You, you have these things, and then you have kids, or you have outings, or you have things that you're involved in and things that we do. We're busy. One of the things I loved coming out of COVID was everything slowed down, and so we weren't as busy because not everything was open, and it was great. Because when you were busy, you found stuff to be busy. And a lot of times what was happening is I kept seeing the church kind of gathering back together and and, and doing it. But then it seems like now it's almost that we're busier than what we were prior to COVID. There's more stuff going on, more things. I keep thinking like, oh, well, as as kids go out and and two of them now are in college, life's going to get slower. And it's not. It doesn't. And I probably thought that my whole life, like when my kids were toddlers and like, oh, well, well, when they can start being self-sufficient, it's going to be better. When they can start taking care of themselves, and it's not, something else just fills the time. Oh, well, when they're teenagers and when they drive, it's going to be better. It's going to be great. They can, they can drive themselves and do stuff, but it doesn't matter. Something still fills that time. We are very busy people. get it. There's a lot of important things on our schedule. But I believe the Christian community gathering together, Christ followers, should be at one of the the top of our list, one of the things that's a priority. Tonight, we're going to meet back at 430. We're going to do a pulse check. Um, The reality is we'll probably have 35 I'd be happy with 40 people that probably show up because we want to talk about the health of our church. I'd love for y'all to show up. We even bribed you with snacks, like in their good stuff. I think snacks. We want to stop for a moment tonight and just see what we're doing and how we're doing it. We want to hear from you. We want to give you a chance to ask questions, do some things. We want to gather back together tonight. We want to gain understanding as a church. We want to grow. We want that these are important. And the reality is there's probably a lot of things on our schedule already that make us not want to do this or not be able to do this. But I'd encourage you, take some time tonight, 4.30. We'll be here an hour, maybe an hour and a half at most. If you stay and talk longer than that, that's on you. But we'll be here for a while. And we would encourage you to come because gathering is important. If you have your Bibles and you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, I don't have the verse on the screen, and there's some Bibles underneath your pews. You can look it up on your phone. You can flip to it in your Bible, or excuse me, Hebrews. If you're in your New Testament and you get to Romans, you keep going. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, keep going. Get to, I think, uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Thessalonians, keep going. You'd eventually get to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. We actually don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Um, but, but how he's talking here and, and what he's saying in the first parts of this, we're going to eventually start on verse 19, but it starts with 19, starts with a therefore. And if you've been around me long enough, I like to explain what the therefores are there for. And so he's, he's talking in these, in these previous verses all about the, the perfect sacrifice of sin. And in the Old Testament, you have to understand there was this yearly sin offering that was offered. So once a year, they would do this sin offering and it would be for the person and, and it, it was this 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 ritual kind of thing that the high priest would go in and he would actually go into the the innermost holy of holies places in the tabernacle and he would offer the sin offering for people. It's crazy. It was really cool kind of practice that they would do. And so they would have this sin offering that happened every, every year. The problem was is they had to continue to go every year to do this over and over again because it wasn't the perfect sacrifice. So what the author is telling us in Hebrews chapter 10 is that Jesus now has come and he now is that perfect sacrifice of our sins. 
where the high priest would have to enter the Holy of Holies year after year doing the same thing and be this mediator between us and God. Now, because of that, Jesus has taken this, this place as ultimate high priest it says that the, the, when he died on the cross that the, the veil was torn, so there is no more separation between the holy of holies place that you couldn't enter because of what Jesus did. So now we have direct access to God. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to other things. We have this direct access. And, and um, uh, the, the author, I'm probably going to say Paul sometimes authored this. It's not Paul, but he wrote most of the New Testament, and I'm going to get messed up some part. So listen, I don't know who wrote Hebrews. No one knows who wrote Hebrews. At some point, I'm probably going to say Paul wrote Hebrews. I didn't mean to say it that. Don't hold it against me. Glad we got that out of the way. This, the author is saying here, because of what Jesus did, because he's this perfect sacrifice, he now is the sacrifice once and for all. We don't have to stand before men anymore to take our requests to God. We can now do that. We can enter into the presence of God. This is huge. It's a huge understanding. It would be a huge understanding for these people back then because there's still Jewish uh, community that's there. They're trying to understand old Jewish like Old Testament laws and practices and all of these things. And now how does Jesus like do this? They're trying to. And if you see most of the letters, you see this idea of, of, of Paul who wrote most of them, like trying to, to do this. The author of Hebrews is always using this high priest, trying to help them understand what it means now and what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did for us. And so if you get to verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has opened for us a new and living way through the curtain. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of the Lord. I want to stop there for a second. I love what he says here. He's like, we have this boldness now. Because of what Jesus did, he has opened a way for us. We don't need anybody else to come and, and do a sin offering for us or, or, or go to God for us. We now can go to God because of Jesus, confess our sins to him. We have this thing because of what it says. And that's what he's saying in here. Like he has opened he has, he has given us this new way through the, through the curtain, through this veil that was there. And that was because of what he did. He, he was a human that died on the cross for our sins, fully human, fully God for us. He has opened a way for us. He is now the high priest. He is over all of these things. Jesus has doing this. And we can boldly approach that. You have sin. You have separation. They appointed a high priest, yearly sin offerings, and they would do this over and over again. And then Jesus came, died once and for all, tore the curtain. Now we have access. That's what he's saying in the first half of this. So let's keep reading, right? It says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of the God, it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil and our bodies washed in pure, washed in pure water. He's saying here, now we, we can draw close to God. Let us, let us draw near with the true heart of worship. And what is he saying? Like, we need to draw near too. He's like, we need to draw near in this fully assurance of faith. The author, if you go, uh, is it the next chapter? Yes. In chapter 11, he gives you a, the best definition of faith that, that's in scripture. He says that uh, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It's this reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. It's this reality that God is who he says he is and this proof that God is going to do what God said he's going to do. That's what faith is. You believe in God and you believe what he says is true and what he's going to do is true. That's what having faith is. That's the easiest definition I can ever give you of faith, I feel like. That God is who he says he is. And now I think for a lot of us, we, we believe that God is who he says he is. That's that reality of our hope. We don't always think that God's going to come through. And maybe that's because we've prayed something sometime and God didn't answer it the way that we wanted it prayed or, or answered that prayer. And so now we're like, eh, God doesn't care. And that's not true. 
It's not true. So he says, let us draw near with this true heart because of the faith that we have. And in verse 23, let's keep reading. He says, and let us hold on to this confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Let us hold now to this, this, this hope, this confidence of a hope. We have to hold to that hope. What is the confidence of our hope? I was thinking about this. Like, like we use these words all the time. We're getting ready to get into Advent. We're going to use like hope and love and joy and peace. Like this idea of hope, this idea of waiting and anticipating, the confession of hope, this confession, this, this, this idea that Jesus is who he says he is. And so we, we, we trust in that. We have this hope that this is true. who Jesus is, what he died for. You see, hope builds on the faith that you have. You have this foundation of faith. God is who he says he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And we then put our hope into that faith. There's this building blocks with it. Christmas is always that one gift you want. As a kid growing up, for me, we circled most of the Sears catalog. Some of you are old enough to remember that. I get excited now. I don't, I, we don't even buy toys, and like the Amazon one comes, and I'm like, oh. And I was like looking through it the other day. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like a 47 year old man excited because the Amazon toy catalog came. I was looking at all the Star Wars stuff, and I was like, ooh, that would be cool. More toys for my office. But as a kid, there's this longing like you ask your parents for something, and you're hoping that it comes. There's this longing and hoping in Jesus because of the faith that we have in there. Let us hold to this confession of our hope and let us do it without wavering since his promise is faithful. And then verse 24 wraps it all up together. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each of you and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's this need for each other. All wrapped in this idea of love. So, so the author here is, is really showing us these, these, these three things that are so important, I feel like, to our Christian walk. And, and I know uh, we're just talking about gathering but the, the point of this is, he's like, look, let us draw near to what? To this assurance of our faith. Let us hold on to that hope that we have. And then let us gather together in love. When we talk about our Christian walk, when we say words like hope and faith, we are like, oh, those are, those are big words in, 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 in our Christian walk. Those are, or those are things that are important. Do you realize the author here is taking these words that are very important, faith and hope, but he's also adding in being together in love, gathering together. It fascinates me. Actually, if you get to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians um, is what's considered the love chapter, and Paul did write that. You know, love is patient, love is kind. It gets recited at all kinds of smushy stuff, I don't know. Um, like, it's this idea, if you don't know what smushy stuff is, ask your parents later. Um, uh, it gets recited on that, but I love the end of it because he says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And it's because when we gather together, when we bond that in love, do you realize this is what we get to do for eternity? You see, at some point when we go to heaven, there's no more need for faith. You will stand face to face. You will know who God is, and you will know what his promises are. Do you realize someday when we step into heaven, there's no more need for the word hope? Because we will be standing face to face with our hope. Everything that we've hoped for. The one thing that remains is love. And if you go back in Hebrews, it says, don't neglect 
provoking or, or being, consider one another in order to provoke love into good works. Gathering is so important. It's so vital to the church. When we're together, it's so important. It was around 10 years ago, um, uh, Jalen's dad passed away, and uh, she got the call on a Sunday morning <clears throat> that it had, she had just been out to visit him, and, and things were turning, and uh, we we're trying to get ready for church, and we we're trying to do things, and obviously I was on staff, and we we're trying to figure out how in the heck do we get her out of here, and do we get her to the airport, do we do these things, and I still remember to that day the, the, the sequence of events that happened because she was trying to get out on Sunday. Um, a good friend of ours came over. And he actually was an airline pilot. And he said, don't worry about it. Pack what you need. And he sat down and he figured it out. It's like, here's your ticket. Just go. And then the next day after church, I was having to go. And we're like, well, what do we do? We have three kids that are We'll see, Ella's 16, so you would have been six. Yeah, six, six, eight, and 10. Like, it, one of the things in ministry for us is we've, we've never been around family, really. So this has been our family. Like, church has been our family. So, like, my, my parents just can't come over and watch the kids because they were hours <laughs> away. Um, Jalen's family has lived all over while we're together. And I watched our life group and some of those people close to us just start stepping in and they're like, don't worry about your kids, we have them. Don't worry about this, just go, just be. And we flew to, to Oklahoma, which wasn't close to North Carolina, if you know your map. And we had to figure out how to take care of all of this stuff with her dad. And I, I'm still so thankful for our church because I didn't have to take care of all of this stuff at home because I knew people were taking care of it. You say, why is gathering important? One of the things does, it just builds community. It builds community. When we need each other, it's here. When things get turned upside down, we're, we're here. I don't know how some people do it in life. When it's tough when we go through unforeseen things. It fosters this community. It promotes love. It really does. And I understand we can get frustrated. I understand we have a lot of different temperaments, different attitudes, different uh, ways of looking at things, different ways of saying things, different ways of doing things. But what I love is that it can all be wrapped in love and, and you get along. You just do it. cultivates, encouraging. You come in and you're down or you're frustrated. And when we're honest with each other and you're like, you know, like, are you all right? Most of us are like, ah, oh, I'm fine. We're not. It's okay. But encourages. I love seeing when someone's down or encouraged and there's someone else that stops and prays with them or talks with them or sits with them. It strengthens fellowship, not coffee and donuts. It strengthens true fellowship where we believe and we're striving towards the same goals. And I think it deepens spiritual growth. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up as you are already doing. Colossians 6, or 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Don't give up being together. Don't give up being together. One of the first, the, the first church, one of the examples that they gave us is that they were together. That's what I want our DNA to be. I was thinking about this. Because usually it, it happens and it's like, oh, well, I wish people would show up to this and this. And, and I started to think about this. And there's, 
there's a piece of our church where this is happening. Some of you are here for Bible studies and you're here for prayer night or you're here for um, a Bible study that's away somewhere else or you're helping out on Wednesday nights or you're here on Sundays or like our worship team. I, I usually, I love our, I say usually, <laughs> only because it got canceled this last week, but uh, that's why I said usually. I always love the time that we get to get together because it's just fun. We, we come spend an hour here and we get to do something that I love to do. I love to play music and, and we joke and laugh and we make fun of each other and, and uh, um, yeah, and it's just fun. I love that time of gathering. I don't I hate it when we miss it. There's something important about gathering, something vital to the health of the church, something more than just an hour on Sundays. And I would encourage you to realize that not only is gathering not essential, but it's also biblical. Gathering is essential. Gathering is biblical. Gathering helps us. It fosters community. It promotes love. It cultivates encouragement. It strengthens fellowship. It deepens us spiritually. And the first church did it. And they saw it was important. And I feel like we need to make sure it's as important to us too. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you for this time together. I thank you that... We can meet in this place today. God, I thank you we live in a country that we can gather any time we want without fear or without thought of what might happen. God, I thank you that you've given us a beautiful place to gather. Thank you for the little things that we have here that we take for granted. But God, help us not take for granted just the importance of being together as a family. God, let us have meals together. Let us share time together. Let us sit around fire pits together. Let us go to breakfast. Let us do things together. More so than just gathering on a Sunday morning. Let our lives be intertwined and wrap it in love. God, we thank you. We give you all the praise and honor and glory. It's in your name. We pray these things. Amen.